I'm not going to use the microphone because I have a really bad effect on technology and you know the world will explode or something. Um, I'm going to read mostly from my new book, which you can buy for seven pounds tonight and make the job centre happy with me. Yes, voilà. buying this book will put one up to the government. Um, I like to reimagine myth from the point of view of the marginal. Often this is women, sometimes it's not. Um, this one is a, an older one, it's in this book. It struck me that in the Odyssey, Odysseus sets out with 10,000 men, goes to the war, how many get back to Ithaca? One. That's a hell of an attrition rate. So, as you do, I rewrote the Odyssey. As you do. And uh, this is called Bearing Witness, which is from the point of view of one of them who didn't make it back. What kind of a man ties himself to the mast without even a knife in his boot? It was three hours later we noticed him signalling, halfway to Scylla and Charybdis before we untied him. We enjoyed a laugh. It's all very well, weaning yourself on opium, lotus, whatever, but when your reward is to tie yourself to the underside of a fucking sheep, well, <laughs> there are sheep at home, that's all I'll say. And, and pigs. Pigs! Not one of us got a look in while he, the big O, screwed Cersei's brains out. So good he just had to go back. So sorry your mum died, she said the second time, cooing those big, dear eyes, long legs pulling him back down the bed. We knew whose wand had the pulling power, but it is his same thing about science, not skill. Holy moly. So, yeah, we knew the signs. Ten year contract, there were seven years left, no sign of Ithaca. Not good odds. And then we were hungry after a year of acorns. 600 cattle, we fancied a steak. Oh, he told us no, but you know, after the trip out, the whole war, the flesh eaters, the singing birds, there's only so much no you can take. We were shipwrecked, of course. Only one survivor, and Odysseus, free of us, fell on his feet, another dame with the sea, Calypso. Seven years there, and then a princess, while we waited this ditch for a hint of blood. Bastard. <laughs> <laughs> Odysseus' wife, and when thinking about Penelope, I was sort of riffing on the depressingness of politics about women left behind, women waiting, a little bit of Middle East, a little bit of World War II, and I came up with this. Penelope. Only one room left standing. Two miraculous windows carry cracks that half write his name. The ceiling now exposed as roof. She will not move. He will get lost, she says, if I am not here. No word yet. She sews, making do, waiting. God buried under next door. Only cats creep out and prowl the street. She draws the curtains at dark. Try to look away. Look back. A little area of blackout. It's her candle. It's beads. Mm. And carrying on again, there was a time in the, in the news where everything seemed to revolve around water. Uh, incidentally, I'm, I'm moving around because I'm disabled and standing still is a really difficult thing to do, so I shift weight a lot. Um, all the things that news that was, seemed to involve water, tragedies of water, floods, all sorts of things. Um, and this meshed in my mind uh, with various people who drowned by water, one of whom was well, as opposed to traveling by what, I guess. <laughs> um, one, one of which who was Virginia Woolf, who drowned herself just before the Second World War when she started hearing voices again as the war was coming. And um, this is called A Soldier's Wife, or it's Talent House. Uh, Talent House is, a, is one of the houses she grew up in. It's in St. Ives in Cornwall. Sometimes, 
Virginia wanders through the hallways, dripping wet. I am forced to take a launch out past the point just to get away. Sometimes. When I return, she is tucked up in front of the TV, watching the news. Another thousand deaths half a world away. Contam contaminated saline in hospitals. People dying of thirst after floods. I compose another email full of empty space and nothing in particular, wishing I could hear you above imagined choppers and the laughing devils in sandstorms that drown in the garden. Virginia pockets war rocks. Uh, so I'm also the 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 book is called The Weight of Coming Home, which is all about sort of definitions of self. And I may have started out American, but I got better. I now have a red passport. Um, um, one of the things I do occasionally is go back to the States and step into the life my parents had for me, which is not exactly my life. Um, but one thing that I, I was thinking on on one of the, these migrations was things that sing and how I could write a self-portrait in them. This is, therefore, cunningly titled, Self-Portrait in Things That Sing. One, grasshoppers. When I was stopped from riding my tricycle down the cold cement stairs, it was only natural I tried to catch something living. There was something of a trend for grasshoppers. I ran my Tupperware lid backwards through the grass, scraping the frantic scrabble of legs on plastic the queue I'd won. It was, of course, over summer. Grasshoppers were such a fad, woolly sold plastic cages for them. The high arch and dome of Songbird jails, and twenty at the scale, and a ring for carrying. We were all proud. One morning, there was a body on the plastic floor. The head was caught high between bars, ripped clean off. After that, I never caught another, and fireflies, though jarred, were barely held three minutes. I had come to abhor restraint. Two, crickets and tree frogs. I had moa which isn't irrational at all. It's quite logical to fear running over a frog with a lawnmower. <laughs> it was always summer. Crickets sang with tree-born amphibians, forming the burden of hot nights. In tents, under stars, the good luck crickets and cree frogs brought our hearth, spread its arms over us, yet never prevented sunburn, aloe and hydrocortisone. We traded Mexican jumping beans. Three, cicadas. 17 years underground and an eon of keeping me awake. The Indian summer jeered at studious us and bodies two inches deep crunched underfoot. Tempers were desperate. The caffeine didn't help. We'd shut windows to find feet climbing up on our screens. Batter same with shoes. Drink less caffeine. Drink more. Drone drilling through earplugs and the clock tower sounding hourly through every night, mocking us. Repraiser, con jet lag. I wake when all sleeps within. Heavy heeled, I walk the halls and kitchen, catch the last night breath of summer, remove my earplugs, the red and yellow stripes, pull on, step into slippers. Pad into the trees, surrounded in unsleeping song. Open my mouth, draw in the world. I'm not a southerner. Uh, I'm from New England. And New England is made entirely of granite and trees. Um, and this is just incidental scenery. Long walks in the woods. Part of my geography these lean antelope trees, their conflicting angles loud in December winds. Deer tracing their way through leaf mold layered with snow. Boulders lined by thyme, roots, the thrust of the earth. My time here is delineated by tidal flux, the hibernation of seasons. I cannot follow the deer, have forgot the skills of youth and how to leave no sign. Tell me again. How we wove twi twilights into our story of what never was and learned to believe the stars' fictions. Once, there was a child grew to woman, spun her singular track across oceans, 
wore out shoes in every other country. Her footprints waited for her. Gravity did not forsake her. She ebbed and flowed to these woods, but never stayed. Tell me again how we stay together on never lonely. How hands warm never cools. How we can walk in these woods, the rushing of the melt around us, the tears of the children we never had, the sighs of future snows. And I lived in Malvern for ooh, nearly a decade. And the main thing about Malvern is that it's very vertical, which means that it doesn't flood. This is very relevant when everything around you is a floodplain and is regularly deluged. Um, there are times where I'd try for an hour and a half to get more than a mile from my house and could, you know, every single direction. <laughs> so this is tidings. The Severn is a long pulse of flood. Wales weeps endlessly. Her tears wash down through her fingers and England to a greater sort. Swans swimming on Worcester tracks commonplace. Smugglers tunnels and stories of them fill up and the ghosts of walled up nuns drowned hands interlaced. Peregrines still pray by the cathedral, kestrels weather on nest ledges, try by not moving to be invisible to water. Malvern is again islands. Flame calls to flame, signaling tragedy beacon by beacon. There's no getting more than a mile from home. The Priory rings out, warning, warning. Far from its bells, the water eats echoes, returns memories of an inland sea. Don't have to. <laughs> and I promised you that I would do a few weird ones. So here are a few odd ones. They're short, perhaps blessedly short, we'll find out. And they're all about stories. One has been accepted for publication at a, by the Science Fiction Society of America or some such thing. Don't ask me, it's only, I was only born there. Uh, the Witch Box. Hide the skin of a seal woman. She'll cry, of course, but she'll marry you. Teach her the rhythms of your day. Breakfast, commuting, nightly pleasures. Teach her to worship the sun rather than weep at the moon's pull. Your children will be strong. Go into a trade where there's water. Mind you keep some things to yourself. Shake three grains of salt from the witch box every night into each corner of the house. Make sure, last thing last, the skin is locked up tighter than a shotgun. Mind now, if she finds it, if she slips into her unforgotten self, you'll find yourself ebbing. You'll shatter the witch box, drink only salt wine. Mm. Now Donald burst into floods of tears when I said I wasn't going to ring Mary Magdalene tonight. <laughs> he really did, he cried. He said, I've got, got a pop copy of it, you can read it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm not reading Mary Magdalene, but I, this is about Lilith, which I, who I, I hope know. is Lilith, so I hope that's a, an acceptable substitute. Lilith dreams again at the end of time. I do not know that I dreamt, only that I sang to a riddle of stars. Who then? Who then? And no one voice answered. Instead, inaudible, a chorus of based hosts, soprano needs. I walked along deep waters, throwing names into the rift, including yours, including mine. The rain that fell was no baptism. No shock of cold, birthing self, selves. I sang, walking, unnaming, till I wore to footsteps, did no more than echo against the dark-hearted and anonymous sky. Mm. Yeah. Nice one. Uh, last weird one, The Fishwife's Lament, and all you need to know really for this one, not that it makes much sense anyway, is um, that Billingsgate, the fish market in London, has actually been around for over 500 years. Um, the fishwife's lament. 
I bid in this gate cry you into the false dawn. You are peerless. You shine. What you offer me is only everything, love, flesh, sex. When I have filleted, gutted, parceled you off in the early light, then I will remember when we jit about barefoot on cliffs, picnicked on every waste ground, offering a feast to the unwary, our hands to the woman in the wet t-shirt who didn't give a damn. When I have sold out of you, your patina will dance and rot on my skin. I shall fast on Fridays, and I shall always feel hungry. Mm. I started with an old one, so I'll finish with an old one. This one is a, this is a performance piece I've done several times. Um, and uh, just sort of going backwards into roots and back into mythology. As I said, discuss later, American women do mythology because they have nothing else to believe. <laughs> Pharaoh's concubine. Of course he was divine. He said so. There are many types of sacrifice. I was 13, just. Pretty, straight nose, long neck, a way of speaking. So they said. Just shy, really. All the gold, the pomp, the myrrh-laced ceremonies, the solemn and smoky intonations, all the choreographed apparitions cowed me, as I suppose it was meant. When at last he came to see me, I was shocked to see two arms, two legs, and not a falcon's head or even a jackal's, but slightly uneven teeth, dark, soft eyes, and a pimple, expertly disguised. I smiled. The years passed in rich, encoded rituals. We both aged. Both, it turned out, kept our figures. When at la last his bar left him, I wept and was passed on. And now, listening to the litanies in the new temple, praising his ineffable divinity, I sing all the words and do what I want. But sometimes, when I watch Ra's solo bark passing, I can't help wondering if, when they weigh my soul, he'll be clear-skinned and waiting, and if he still snores. <laughs> Thank you very much.